How to build Doug's Repair Shop, a model railway building. Hi modellers, I'm Chris, the modeller at ABR Model Works. Welcome to the build video for Doug's Repair Shop. The detailed instructions that come in the kit are also in sync with this video and include the time code chapter markers for easy navigation. This is a great tool for both experienced and novice modellers. It allows the experienced modeler to skip ahead and the novice modelers to watch the model being built. It also includes some great tips and how-tos. The instructions and video are broken up into three main areas. Preparation, painting and assembly of the panels into the main structure. 3D printed scenic detail parts. And then bringing them all together to finish the building. You can save time on the building by working on both the panels and the 3D parts jumping between each whilst waiting for glue or paint to dry. Now before we start, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel and hit that little bell icon as we'll be posting updates on the modular model building system that will help you with this build and others in the future. As always, we welcome your feedback and questions. It will help us make better models and video content for you. So add your feedback and questions to the comments below. Lastly, as this is one of our first kit build videos, it's not as polished as I'd like. So please forgive me. I'll work to do better. A Hollywood director, I'm not. So as always, I lay up my tools and then put the panels and the items that need to be uh, sanded that are part of the kit. So panels, in this case the uh, roof, door, walls and ground floor all laid out ready to, uh, to get started. So the first thing that we do in building any of these kits is we sand the uh, various items and as always I use the 3M uh, 320 grit sanding sponges. So we need to sand to clean up the surface so it's ready for painting and at the same time remove any debris from the laser cutting and uh, glue residue, especially on brick panels, etc. That way the paint will adhere to them. Now whenever you're sanding any type of timber, or, or in this case MDF, uh, dust is something that's just not good for you. So I've got a spray booth that allows me to suck that dust away. So we'll start that up and we'll get on with sanding. Now it doesn't need a lot, but we just need to clean the surface and we do it while the item still in its mounted frame. So quick sand just to get the, to clean the surface up on both sides because in this case this is a model that you will see inside. So we will be painting the inside of the uh, model. Quick dust off getting the, uh, the dust into the spray booth so that it disappears outside. We have a nice clean piece of MDF now. So I'll go ahead and sand all the rest and uh, come back to you in a minute. Okay, so we've done all of the panels. I'll now do the ground. So next we need to do the brick panels. Now on these, the panels and the door are engraved on both sides, so both sides need to be done. Uh, the roof doesn't, that just needs to be sanded on the top. This is really important for the brick because if we don't sand this well, the residue from the glue in the laser cutting process will dissolve when, when you paint it and add cement mortar, which we use the uh, model light from Deluxe Materials. This needs a little bit more care than just the panels themselves. So we'll get the ventilation going and uh, we'll get into it. Not uncommon for the parts to start to come out at this stage but you still want to put them back inside the frame to sand the other side. It helps to hold them in place. So I'll roll it over, put the piece in, do the same thing for the wall, drop it back in the frame. That way it's being held and uh, less likely to be damaged. We don't have to go back completely to bare wood. We just need to make sure we've got the worst of the uh, glue and any debris left from the laser cutting process. So that one's done. We'll put that to one side. We'll do the roof next. And last of all, the roller door. Now the roof and the roller door aren't quite as critical as the brick because on these items, we're not going to be using the uh, model light. To 
Okay, so next up we're going to uh, pop the panels out from their holding ports. We need to break away tabs. Now when you're doing that, be sure as to hold the top and the bottom because the top and the bottom can quite easily be broken away as the system's designed so you can break them away if need be. Now with sections like this that are open at the bottom, um, you need to be particularly careful because um, we don't want to break it off. Now they're not uh, cut through so it's not as bad but nevertheless you just need to make sure you support it so you don't snap it off. Okay so we have four different panel types. One for the roller door, one for the ground floor entry, two um, opening panel one are used on um, the back and for a window on the side so they all will, will uh, slot together. Now what I forgot to mention, in this build we won't be using them. These are the supports for the ground floor, the uh, roof and individual floors. If, uh, if they're needed to support a floor, in this case our roof section has its own supports which will be used slightly differently to how the other builds go. Okay. So the next thing we need to do is sand off these holding tabs that hold the panel inside the holding frame. Again, just be very careful. Just a very light sand, it doesn't take a lot. There are little holding tabs in these corners that need to be removed as well. All we're trying to do is just remove the tops of those. So you don't need to get too carried away. So now we have done that, the next thing is, is to make sure that they all slot together nicely. And you'll have noticed that I have a metal plate, a piece of galvanized iron. And the reason why I have that is that I like to use some magnets to put a straight edge on the bottom. And I use the straight edge to make sure that the bottom edge of the panels line up nicely. That way the building will be nice and square. So the next thing we'll do is we'll grab a 2 foot or 600 mil straight edge or ruler. Uh, in this build we have a, the garage door, we have a ground floor entrance, a two panel opening on the end wall and a one panel opening with a large window on the other end wall and then two two opening panels that go on the back. As you can see they slot together nicely but what we need to make sure is that they are sitting square. So sometimes you may need to sand a little bit out of the tabs just to get that alignment right. And what I like to try to do is get all of the panels as if they were like one long wall lining up. Now if it's a much bigger building you might do it in sections. At some point when we glue it together that angle is going, the end piece is going to go like that so it does need to slot in so this is a good time to make sure that it does that and then this one goes in there no it needs a little bit of a sand so I haven't quite got those tabs done enough and that one so that's all quite nice and then these are the, going to be the back ones but they're going to join onto this so let's make sure that they sit in place nicely that's good and just for good measure we'll take the other end and we'll check that that lines up nicely as well and it does okay so we've got our two ends our back wall and our front wall and everything is connected nicely so the next step is to glue these two pieces together what we do is we roll them upside down to glue them because different sheets of MDF can have slight variations in the thickness so when we glue it together, we glue it together upside down. And the reason for that is that way is that the face is going to be nice and level and flat. And it doesn't matter so much if the back has a tiny step in it because it's inside the building and you probably won't see it. Now, as you can see, these two openings are slightly different in size. One on top has got slightly higher, but it's not as wide as the other one. And the reason for that is that this one takes our roller door and this one takes the entrance which goes in there like so. So we'll sand those afterwards to make them fit. It's up to you which way round they go and in fact if you wish you because it's engraved on both sides you can put the panel in either way depending on whether you want the door on the right or the left. Um, I'm going to put it in this way because I want my doorway close to the roller door to the entrance to the workshop etc. So what we'll do is we'll just remove those for the moment 
And we'll get those ones out of the way and then we're going to roll this one over and that one over and we'll put some glue on it and get it uh, glued up and drying. So a little bit of glue, whoops that's a heap too much. Just a little bit of a little bit of glue on the top edge. It will run down when you squeeze it together. Put it together, push it down onto the ruler, wipe any excess off and then again I like to use a few magnets to put it all together. Alright so that one's together. Let's do the same with this one. We'll roll it over. I'll just double check it. Um, now speed bond is really really good. It says five minutes. I like to leave it for about ten but it dries super fast and it gives you a nice strong bond that you can handle in that five ten minute period unlike other PVAs. Now part of the secret in doing that is not over gluing. When you put too much glue on the more glue the more the solvents within the glue have to evaporate and it takes longer to dry. So if it's just a small amount it will dry up pretty quickly. What we will also do is we'll just add a little bit of glue on the surface once it's dry because we want to sort of fill these couple of little gaps and then we'll use glue to do that and then once we'll sand it back we'll then put a little bit of model light on there as well just to sort of finish it off so that it's a nice smooth surface on the inside as well. Okay so the panels have now had about five minutes not quite ten and as you can see that the glue has dried enough that they're strong enough to handle still not super strong um, but you can handle it which is good so we can get on with the uh, the next steps so before we do anything else what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run a little bit of glue on these lines on both sides to help the strength in the areas that can be broken away and although you probably can't see this on the video the laser has cut through and there's a series of tabs holding that top section on. By squeezing some glue in there that will strengthen that area up quite a lot. Um, right now if you were to drop it you can actually break that away which is not a big problem because you can glue it back on. Once it goes together with the bracing parts for the roof, the side parts for the roof as well, it becomes super strong so it's not that critical. But nevertheless I, I like to just run a bead of glue along there and then these little bottles, you can get them from your hobby shop. These ones are in fact made for or by Deluxe Materials. The end has a nice round end which allows you to put just the right amount of glue. But when you're going over these little seams, it actually tracks along the seam quite nicely and you're squeezing the glue into the gap. It does the job really well. So just line it up, run the bottle along, give it a little bit of a squeeze, not too much, just enough to to, uh, to fill it up. I also follow the joint line with a little bit of glue as well and I'll rub that in in a moment. Enough glue in there. I just use my fingernail run down that joint line just to push the glue in because we still want that little recess because that's an architectural feature. So you don't want to fill it up completely. Well you can do. In fact in some buildings the idea is you do. In this building uh, we've designed this one so that we don't use the card pilasters for the corners. We're actually going to fill the little gaps with uh, model light and have a square finish. Now the two end pieces, um, I'm going to do the uh, put a little bit of glue across there as well. Okay so the glue is dry enough now that we can give the surface a, uh, a very light sand. We're just going to sand it enough to remove the surface of the glue. Next what we want to do is add these couple of supports for the roof. A little bit of a sand to remove their holding tabs. Just above the doorway and the thin one goes on the back. Two slanted ones go on the sides. So now we're ready to glue on the roof supports. Now because we're working in a mirror image I like to just double check to make sure that I've got the pieces in the right place before I start gluing. It's a little bit like that old saying, measure twice, cut once. So in this instance, that's our front. That's where the roller door is going to go and the office door on this side. This is the large window for the workshop area. This is a uh, single window with a brick insert and then the back wall. The back wall is the same both sides so it's not as critical. Well, all the pieces sit at the joint line and what you do is when you glue it on is you make sure that it's just slightly less than the end on both sides. There's just a little bit of a gap. So I use these pieces as spaces while I'm gluing these two pieces on and then once that's done these pieces just need to sit inside 
the uh, the frame itself. Ready to go, let's get gluing. Give our little bottle a bit of a shake, get some glue down there. Again, just sparingly. You don't need a huge amount. Less is more, so they say. In this instance, it also helps with the speeding up of the, the drying. Now while it's still damp like that, it does want to slide around a bit, so you just need to be a little bit careful that when you get it in its final resting place that it is lined up. Again, like I said, get this piece. Yep, I've got just a little bit of extra gap. Yep, a little bit of gap on both sides. Put that off to one side and grab a couple of our magnets just to put a little bit of downward pressure to help the, the glue bond. Uh, anywhere where there's pressure pushing the two surfaces together, you'll get a much better joint, a much better bond, sorry, if the if the glue is sort of forced out. So again, just a little bit of glue, just smear it on, doesn't need lots. Again, just eyeball it, line it up, get it on that joint line. At this stage it'll slide around a little bit, but that's okay, because that's helping to squeeze the glue out. Just get it nice and straight. It could probably go just a little bit more. So what I'm doing is I'm using my thumb, levering it up just a little bit, just so that I, yep, so that's fine, that's fine. And I've got it sitting nicely on the joint line. Again, these two have to oppose each other. And again, I'm going to put it on along that joint line. But this time, what we're going to do is make sure that the end is level here and level there. So a little bit of glue, place it on there like so. Let it slide around a little bit which helps to spread the glue and then just push it until it lines up just nicely. It should be fractionally short and now we'll let that sit for a few minutes just to, to dry up. First one off, that's all nicely lined up, that's good. That feels like it's got glue in there but I'm just going to probably just rub just a little bit of, of the uh, model light on this. You do need to really sort of rub it on the surface because you need to get the surface to um, accept it. That'll rub off nicely and uh, that small thin um, bit will be dry in 20 minutes. Enough to give it a light sand because we're not putting a great deal on. Same sort of theory as the uh, as gluing. So the panels have now had about 15-20 minutes to let the model light uh, dry off and we'll just give them a very careful sand. Basically what you want is to sand it to the point where there is no edge from the, the model light. So it needs to be sanded to its, to its a complete feathered edge. So you can see the edge of the, uh, the texture of the model light there. And here it's sanded back to the point where there is no defined line on the edge. And these couple of little pieces, hit them with the blade. And I'll just flake away. Just cleaning up the... The front face, because it's been on the bench, there is a little bit of the model light still and some of the powder. So we just want to make sure that it's all removed for the undercoating process. One of the other things I like about having a metal bench is that you use metal blocks just to sort of, you know, place things together to make sure that the, uh, the fit is there. There we go. There's our walls all nicely assembled, ready for the next step, which is uh, the painting stage. Now, with this building, I'm wanting to not use the pilasters that you would use on some buildings. Um, so we have, we have these card pilasters that you glue to the face to disguise the joints. What we're going to do is undercoat the whole thing and paint the inside of the building and have the outside undercoated and then using model light I'm going to very carefully fill in some of these joint lines. We're still going to leave most of them so that it has that architectural look but the corners where they butt together we're going to use model light to fill that and then sand it back so it's a nice clean square corner and that will give it a nice modern look about it using the uh, roller door and the other walls as features. So the next step is to give that first undercoat. So we've got all of our parts laid out, they're all being sanded, we've got the supports glued on, the uh, sections that need a little bit of filler have got that done as well. It's now time to start the next step which is 
sealing the timber before we put the undercoat on. Now what I do from a sealer point of view is I mix up 50% water and 50% speed bond. In this particular brew I decided to use a little bit of the Vallejo black whereas previously I've just used the grey and to be honest with you I think in the future mixes I'll be just using the grey. The reason for the colour is so that you can you can see the difference between where you've been and where you haven't been on some of the timber etc. The black hasn't mixed quite as well as I would have hoped for and so there are um, some not solid pieces of black but you'll see when we when we put it on that's a little bit motley and you need to sort of scrub it out a little bit more with the uh, with the paintbrush. We'll be starting by painting the sealer on the bottom of the ground sheet and the inside of the walls um, and the bottom of the, the roof to seal it. And when that dries off enough to handle, we'll then paint the more visual surfaces. We'll get on with painting this piece first. I want to make sure that you've got a good even coat. Now on the underneath side, not as critical, but still the coat needs to be there to waterproof it to a degree which will help uh, when you're mounting it on your in the scenery we'll stop it from warping when we do the other uh, processes so we'll just put that to one side let it dry up do the same for each of these pieces good scrubbing motion get rid of much of the okay now we're going to move on to doing the brick pieces now I've got all of these pieces with the outside face up. I'm going to roll it over to the inside. And here we really need to scrub the brick sections because we don't want any buildup in the mortar areas. You'll also start to see that this area that I'm working in will become quite grimy. And that griminess is the glue from the MDF dissolving in the moisture. The sealer coat now is on the back side of all the pieces, ready to do the front side. Okay, so we now have all those pieces coated on both sides. We need to let them dry for a good hour before we sand them back and, uh, and see what the surface is like. At that point we'll make a decision as to whether they get a second coat of uh, the sealer or whether we've sealed them well enough to be able to go on to the undercoating stage. Okay, so we've got all the pieces ready to go for the undercoat, all nicely rubbed back and nice and smooth. We're going to use the Vallejo uh, US Khaki as a undercoat colour. Uh, as I've said before, in nature, well not so much in nature, but concrete and bitumen and, and uh, products like that, because they're made up of stones of variety of colours, when you look at them from a distance, they look a particular colour, but when you come up nice and close, they uh, are nice and uh, have a bit of a mottly look about them. So if you're painting with different layers of colour, you end up with a more natural looking product at the end. So I'm going to give this one a go on this particular build. We'll paint the concrete floor and the walls with this undercoat. We'll use the, the Vallejo Glory Red on the brickwork. Turn the uh, air on for the spray booth. Again, you want to mist it on. So we'll start by painting the inside first of the walls, getting it onto the edges. Now you don't want to overdo it at this point. You just want a, a light coat. It doesn't give complete coverage. The idea is, is that you build it up. And again, this is just an undercoat. What we're doing now is painting the surface so that it will accept the final colours that we put on it. It's also part of the sealing process so that we don't end up wasting a lot of the, the final colours that we're going to use. We'll put all that off to one side, let it dry overnight and we'll come back to it in the morning and start working on the other colours. Alright, so I have pre-mixed some paint off camera. I'm using the Vallejo Surface Primer Ghost Grey to mist over the uh, work that we've done so far. I'm looking for a, a, a more greyish looking concrete colour with this particular building and we'll be starting by painting the uh, inside area first 
and doing the outside as a separate exercise. Now the idea is to mist it on and to build it up in layers so we're not trying to put too much paint on in one go. And we're going to focus on the parts that we, uh, we will see. I'm going to let those dry thoroughly and give them a, a, uh, a light sand and then another coat of the grey to finish this part of the build process. Okay, so the undercoat is uh, now dry on all of our pieces. Uh, I've just got a lackey holding the building together so you've got an idea of, of uh, what it's going to look like. Next we need to paint the brick walls themselves. Um, I have mixed a mixture of German red brown and Israel sand together to come up with a brick colour. I'll be using a sheet of plastic to do the painting on because as you can see it's a little messy. We'll be doing one side letting that dry and then once that's dry enough to handle we'll roll it over, paint the other side and then we'll put those pieces aside for a good 24 hours to let them dry before we do the mortar joints, the uh, model light from Deluxe Materials. So it's a little bit of a scrubbing action this, it's not uh, a uh, a nice you know even painting action we want to get a a nice coat on but at the same time we don't want to fill the uh, mortar joint lines now if it's not a hundred percent even it's not critical because modern day bricks are fairly consistent in their color but depending on the period of time that you're modeling the bricks may be very inconsistent in in um, in color um, I suggest you go to good old Google and do an image search to uh, have a look at brick walls to see what flavour of brick wall you want as far as the modelling is concerned. Once you have painted the brick panels you must let them dry for at least 24 hours because if you try to put the mortar in uh, too soon it will dissolve the paint you'll end up with a similar looking colour to the mortar. It probably won't be the effect that you're looking for. So I'll give these about uh, 20 minutes or so to get quite dry and then I'll roll them over and do the reverse side. Okay, so we're ready to do the back side of these panels. So we're done with that and we'll move on to the next part of the build. Okay, this is fitting together quite nicely. So what we'll do is we'll take the blacky band back off and pull it apart and we'll glue it together. So just a little bit of a bead of a glue along the edge. Now I'm not too bothered if there's a little bit of glue on the outside because we're going to be sanding that, but I don't want any glue to show through on the inside. So if it does come through, just a little skew it or remove it. Slide him in. Now we'll just get our, our roof and we'll sit it in there to help it stay square. We'll get a bunch of luckies because what you want to do is have it being squeezed quite tightly to make sure that it all goes in uh, so, that it, so that the joints are, uh, are tightly pushed together. Just have a look around at the corners and make sure that everything is together properly. We'll give that about 20 minutes to set up and then we'll move on to the next stage. Now the modular model building system is designed in such a way that you can mix and match various components to come up with a different look. So you can have you know literally dozens of, of buildings that are made from it all looking quite different. And so for this particular building, the way I'm putting it together, I want it to look like a relatively modern, uh, almost tilt-up building, although I'm going to have a feature brick wall in the front, um, a feature brick in this window area, and feature brick there and there, and here we're going to have a window for the back of the workshop, and on this end a large window. And so it won't have trim pilasters, on the corners, which we do on a lot of buildings to hide the corner. What I'm going to do there 
is I'm going to fill those areas with Deluxe Materials Model Light. So the thin line either side will disappear, but this heavy line um, and these heavy lines coming down, they will remain, um, and the thin line at the top will remain. So they may be filled in as we go at this point while I'm um, applying it because the center here needs to, to be uh, filled as well, but I'll scribe them back out afterwards. So. so the way I do it, again, we just don't want to get too carried away because you don't want great globs there to sand away. The first thing I do is I get some on the end of my finger and I smear it into the surface so that it bonds. And on a corner like this, I'll do that first. I'll do the other side, smearing it into those grooves. Now, there is a small step there, so I do want just a little bit of extra build up in the corner because I want that corner to come back being very sharp. And the same on this one, where the join is. So I'm just going to put a little bit extra. Now, if I make it too flaky, it'll just chip straight off. So this part of the process, it takes uh, an hour or so before you can start to sand it. Two, three, maybe four small applications. Moving on to the next corner, get it on your finger, smooth it in. Again, when you put it on, if it's on fairly lightly in the first instance, it dries faster. But the most important thing is to build up in this first application a layer that allows it to adhere to the surface, not that now I've got into some of the large joints, so I'm not you know, when that's going to happen. So I'm not worried about it because I'll scrape them back out afterwards. Now in this middle area, we are going to remove that joint line altogether. The only ones we're going to have are these side ones. And again, the ones that run across the building, they're going to be completely filled in at this at this stage. But like I say, we'll scrape those ones out afterwards. Now at this point, um, I'll take a scriber and just very lightly, not worrying about whether it's absolutely correct at this stage or not, but I'll just uh, do the first drag through. Two reasons for that is that I don't want it to be a big effort afterwards. So by having a, a line there, you've got a line to, or a groove rather, by having a groove there, you've got a groove that the knife or the saw, just depending on which one you're working on, I use either a knife or a razor saw gives it a path to follow. If you don't get it all out at this stage, it doesn't matter the first application, but when we sand it back, um, I will be uh, cutting it out properly. Um, you'll probably find that this process might you might have to do a couple of times because when you put the next layer on, you may end up again. Now this is already starting to get quite, quite firm. It's only had you know, the few minutes that we've been talking about it. So it's good material. It uh, works well, dries out pretty quickly. Yeah, and like I say, in about uh, maybe even half an hour, but I, give it, I like to give it a little bit longer, especially the first couple of coats. Okay, so there we go. We'll set that off to one side, let it dry up, and uh, come back to it to do the next stage. So this is now dry enough to give it its first light sand. I can tell there's a few spots that are going to need to be, um, that'll need a second coat, so and I was expecting that was going to be the case anyway. So let's get some air on and uh, we'll start sanding. And very gently when you start. If you get too aggressive, then you'll be chipping it away rather than sanding it away, and that'll make more work for you. Now, because we are doing a lot of filler on this particular model, uh, it is highly likely that we're going to go back to wood. And so, although I've painted the inside, I've got paint left over so that I can spray the, uh, the outside again with uh, the same type of colour. Then that way I can build up the undercoat again before we get to the stage of putting a, um, a final colour on the outside of the building. Yep, so here we've gone back to timber. Okay, now we've done that, we work our way around and we pick out uh, any excess that's got into places that we don't want it, because with a bit of luck, if we're careful, hopefully won't fill them up next time around, but this is still going to need quite a bit, so the chances are we will, but nevertheless, we'll clean it up anyway. Okay, so we'll give it a really good dust off. 
so we can put the next coat of water light on. Alright, so we just really need to touch up the corners. So now because we've got some material there, we can bulk it up a little bit, not much. Uh, still better to apply a few coats gradually, building up that nice sharp corner. Yeah, that's quite recessed there, so... Now you could use a putty knife or something like that if you wanted to. I have tried that, and I prefer working it with my finger. I can sort of mould it more, plus I can feel the, the moisture, or the whatever the, whatever the glue is. As you're squeezing it, you're squeezing it out, and you can feel it working into the surface. With the knife, I'll pick away anything that's obviously shouldn't be there. At this stage, the knife just nicely runs through it, so it makes that part of the process really easy. Leave it at that. Okay, so the filler is now dry enough to allow us to uh, rub it back. So the first step is just rub your fingers over carefully, removing any really high spots, anything that's loose, because that'll rub up underneath your sanding block and uh, may cause damage. And very carefully, in a sort of circular motion, just start uh, find those high spots and just very softly work them back. So we've got a few spots with this where we've gone to the timber, so we're going to be putting another coat of undercoat on. That's okay. Okay, so we'll give it a good dust off so that we can really see what our corners look like. Now we'll clean out very carefully these with a razor saw. A bit careful because of the the height of the structure, it's quite solid but it still will flex. Now I'm going to be putting more material on the corners but I still am cleaning them up at this stage because the chances are the next layer is going to be the last layer and so having that little groove in there allows the blade to flow through that spot a little bit more evenly without as much pressure and makes it easier to do it without chipping away what's already there. So you get a little bit on your finger and then you really need to sort of, you know, work it in, moisten that spot for it to here and then just make sure the surface is up high enough that it'll sand away. On the corners now, grub pole corner on both sides first to get that, you, you'll feel it, that it'll be a little bit moist and then the pinching motion, come back, working your way down, building it up so that corner is proud. And last corner, same deal, wet come back along building up the edge so we'll set that aside and let it dry I'll come back in about uh, two or three minutes time and just scrape away some of the excess because as it gets a little bit dry it actually cuts and carves quite nicely with the knife okay so that's now had enough time just to sort of start to set up a little bit so I will carve gently avoiding some spots because I don't want to break the corner. I'd rather it set up nice and hard and we sanded it off. There's a few spots like this that we can just scrape away. Makes the process later a little bit easier. All right, that'll do. I'll um, be patient and put it to one side. Okay, so hopefully this is the final sanding. Okay, so we have it done. Just now, all we need to do is uh, give it a final dust off and uh, clean, and then we can paint the, uh, the outside. All right, so um, I'm now just going to put a little bit of an undercoat on these areas that we've put the model light, and just a little bit more around the top, uh, and then we'll set that one side and let it dry up before we put the, uh, the outside final coat on. Again, we're just misting at this stage. So, we'll let that sit and dry up, and uh, we'll come back, give another blast. The brickwork is actually uh, a feature wall, and the building itself is a little bit more modern. It's uh, a uh, tilt-up style of building. 
and so uh, we're choosing to have a brick pattern that's quite random and so what I'm doing is we're going to have some varying colors to color different bricks or parts of different bricks to have quite a motley type look about our brickwork so the colors I'm going to use Vallejo smoke the wood grain the flat earth and the brown sand and those four colors in combination with the other color of the brick and then when the model white goes on for the mortar and we give it a light uh, gray stain that'll uh, give it a, a nice feature wall type look about it okay so I'll put out a drop or two of each color I'm also going to add on my palette a little bit of thinner so if I need it it's there for the brush and basically you Take a tiny little bit, pick a brick. Doesn't matter if you mix the colours a little bit, gives you different, uh, different looking bricks, and randomly just work your way around. Now, if you want, you can do a pattern. If uh, the uh, imagination takes you that the builder decided to put his bricks up in a pattern, then um, go for it. And of course, the coverage and how many bricks you do also depends on the look you're going for. Like I said earlier, one of the things to do is get on Google, have a look at different brick walls, see what they look like, and experiment. I like to load the brush up, do two, three bricks at a time with that particular colour in different places until I've got you know, a bit of coverage. Don't forget to uh, do around the edges and try to be as random as you can, which I know is a little difficult because often we're not. I'm happy with that, it's looking good. Let's do the bottom bottom half. One wall done on one side. It's a slow process, but at the end of the day, you know, it's relaxing. It's those little details that you add to your railway that really makes things pop. And uh, you'll sit back um, and go, wow, I did that. Again, there we go. Quite happy with that. Looks good. So I'm going to stop the video at this point. You've got a pretty good idea from those two panels. And I'll just go ahead now and work my way through all of those on both sides then we'll put them off to one side give them a good amount of time to dry so that we don't scrub off that paint when we put on the model light all right, the first thing we do is we make sure that we identify the uh, inside of the wall as opposed to the outside now with uh, inside walls they're still uh, made the same way there's a more engraved and less engraved side and so we want to do the less engraved side first so we wipe it on nice and carefully especially when we're going over areas where there are cutouts like doorways and and windows we don't want to we don't want to break uh, anything at this stage especially after all that painting went into doing those those lovely door the uh, lovely bricks wipe away the excess now that's looking pretty cool Just a little bit more on the edge there now, of course, we're going to be applying a wash to this, so that'll knock back the white quite a lot. Um, wipe a little bit off with a dry rag, not too much. We want the uh, mortar lines to stay. And so, there we have it. It's, uh, that's going to look quite cool. All right, we'll keep working our way through them. The other thing about doing the inside walls first is they're going to be the ones that you don't see as much. And... Uh, it's a good place to start from a practice point of view. Certainly make sure you're careful on these, these pieces. This is dry enough to handle, so we'll do the outside pieces now. You can see straight away that there's more depth in that brick cut. And, uh, dry up a little bit so we can scrape away the excess. Okay, so we'll clean them up now. We'll start by scraping back the edges and the doorway and window openings. And then on the surface, we'll just give them a, a light scrape just to get any where it's a little bit too thick. Get the excess off. Expose a little bit more of the colour of those bricks. The same on the inside surface. Now, of course, this has started to dry, but it's not uh, at full strength. So it's only had... I know, 10 minutes or so. Now, you might be thinking that I'm going to a lot of effort on a wall that is uh, on the inside face, but 
depending on where you put this building on your layout you're going to go just there the thing is when you look through the side window there isn't a window on the back on this side but when you look through that side window you're going to see the brick wall and so uh, it uh, just adds to that whole realism that we're trying to achieve the next step for these pieces is that we will be staining them to colour the uh, mortar itself. So we'll leave that for probably about an hour or two to, uh, before we stain it. So we're just taking a little light rub to remove the top of the model light to reveal more of the brick colour underneath. And we want to show off all that nice hard work that we did to get the variety of brick colours. There we go, as you can see we've got nice colour there now. The white will dull back when we put the uh, stain on to make it have a bit of a concrete colour. So I think that looks pretty cool. Missing footage. The mortar wash video footage is missing. So this footage is from the Michaels Freight Depot. The process is the same. Okay, so it's now time to apply a wash to get that cement look in our mortar joints. And I'm going to use Vallejo light gray wash for this process. Do the wall sections next. These need to be done on both sides, and for that reason they need to be stood up. Okay, so that's the walls done. So we're ready now to fit the various uh, brick panels into the openings where they belong. I have already done the door, the roller door, so I'm going to have that as a fully open roller door. We'll just start working our way around. I'm going to pop that back out because these little side pieces, what would be the tracks, are quite thin and easily broken away. So we'll put that to one side. We'll start with uh, the main entrance. And it's a little wide and a little high. However, we'll just clean up the corners because the paint is just occupying it a little bit. A little bit of a paint fillet going on. So we'll do this side first. Now, I sand the opposite side uh, to the doorway if uh, it's a panel that has a door in it because that's quite uh, fragile it won't take much to snap that off so you need to be quite careful when you're working with these. Let's bring it over to my little sanding jig. Put a, a little light chamfer on there so that you don't catch the bricks as you're pushing it in and out and there we go really really easy so need to take top almost down to that mortar line and there we go um, now on this end we have uh, just the panel at the bottom because there's a window going in okay so that's good excellent so i'm going to place these in order of where they're going to live so that we don't mix them up too much um, so if you sand too much off uh, my suggestion is is that you use the deluxe materials um, canopy glue. It dries crystal clear, and once dry, if you've got a little bead um, as a as a little fillet, you'll be able to go back with a very fine paintbrush and just disguise that that little gap if you end up with a gap. So don't be too concerned. Obviously, you want to be as careful as you can, um, but uh, if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the earth. Okay, so we've got that one to go there and that one to go there. There's a window in this one. There we go. It gives you a rough idea of what it's going to look like. And these two pieces, they go together to form a um, uh, an office inside. Sorry, a, a storeroom inside. So, that gives you a, uh, an idea of how that's going to go. The roof, and there's the roof. It's now ready to give the outside a, a, uh, its paint job, and then we can start gluing those panels and the doorway, etc. in. The door needs to be painted, um, and I'm not 100% certain yet what I'm going to do with the roof, but I don't mind that colour, so I'll think about that a little bit more. But um, I'll get the walls painted first, and, uh, and then we'll see. Okay, so off camera I have put some masking tape to cover up all the holes in the inside so that we don't get any of the paint when we're spraying the outside through to the inside walls because I want to retain the uh, cement colour that I've chosen. And I'm going to go with a quite a dark um, grey. It's actually called Dark Sea Grey. 
um, by Vallejo um, as my colour for the outside of the building. Um, so I'll be spraying that on, and uh, but before we get to that stage, I'm just going to take my little sanding block and just very, very lightly just give the surface a very gentle rub, just if there's any little high spots that I've missed when I was wiping it over. And no, it doesn't appear to be. It was good. I'll get the uh, brush and give it a good wipe off. Now any dust that's gone onto that tape will stick to the tape, so I'm not worried about that. And then the last thing I'll do, just before painting, is I'll take a, a cloth, I'll have it so it's damp, and I'll just very lightly rub the surface because that will pick up any fine dirt that decided to stick through static electricity or um, just the brush didn't get it off. So we'll give that a wipe. I'll set the booth and the compressor and spray gun up and we'll get started. Okay, I have my spray booth going. I've got some paint mixed. Um, I'm just going to just make sure it's yep, running nicely. Now, with this, I don't want to get it super wet. I don't want a glossy type finish because concrete is a very matte finish. So I'll have the gun a little bit further away uh, so that that way we're not getting that, that sort of gloss finish. And again, we'll just be misting two or three coats on. Making sure that we, we focus a little bit on the inside of the windows, etc. Now, of course, it's gonna look a little glossy at this stage because the paint is wet, but it will dry, I think, with a, a nice sort of matte finish. Okay, so I think that's pretty close. Again, I'm not trying to get absolute full coverage um, because, you know, we want a little bit of weathering happening, etc. Okay, so let that dry up now and uh, we'll see what we end up with. Okay, so we're getting close to having the building part of the exercise finished. We've still got to uh, fit all of the 3D uh, printed um, detail items, but you know the building for the most part is is now painted. We've got our brick inserts done, our roof is done. There's just a few little touch-ups to do, and uh, so that's really the next job. And then we'll start putting um, windows into the brick panels and the brick panels then into the uh, the building itself. Internally I'm pretty happy with it. I don't think I need to do too much on there but just on the on the top I have missed a little bit so I'm just going to very carefully with a slightly thin down solution of the uh, dark sea grey we'll just touch up those couple little spots. There's a spot just here that just needs going over. There's another spot just on the side here. A couple of the doorways just need a little bit. So I've moved all the parts off to one side except for the set that I'm going to work on. Uh, I've got my glue ready to go, the tools. I've got a container to put the sprues that I'm cutting away. I've got all of the bamboo skewers ready and my uh, racks ready to accept the parts. So let's get started. When you're cutting, you want the flat side of the sprue cutter towards the model because that pushes the sprue away and uh, it doesn't uh, put as much pressure on the part and therefore you've less chance of breaking it. Now in some cases, like I just did, you might need to cut some of the sprue away to get to joints that are behind that you can't quite get to. And there we go, it's now free. I like to just sand off the sprue joints simply by placing it on a flat surface giving it a quick rub wiping it over that's good taking a square needle file doing the sides which is where it's going to go into the the wooden frame and there you have it simple as that oh it didn't didn't do the base same thing for the base just very carefully with the base you don't want a rocking motion, otherwise you, you'll uh, spoil it. Nice and upright, and just gently backwards and forwards. Now, we're going to put a little double glue on our bamboo. Don't need a lot. There we go, first one done. Just enough glue to hold it for the spraying purpose, but not too much, and it doesn't want to bead up so that it, you're getting it over the front surface. Um, but that'll be fine. Look, some of them, when you're 
painting them may break off and you may need to glue them back on again but this is a great way to do it as I've sh uh, shown past it allows you to simply paint and rotate your product and um, it makes it very easy to paint okay so this door is a little different to the other two that I've already done the other ones are designed to go on the outside of the building so they don't have a face on both sides whereas this one does so you do need to be a little bit more careful at the end of the day once you've pulled it away there will be a slightly better side and you tend to put that on the side that uh, is less noticeable so same process very carefully cut away where the sprue is connected now this one has a little sprue coming up to that handle and you just want to very carefully get the point in there to uh, break it away if you get too aggressive or you come too far down you'll break the handle off the door so I'm going to remove the rest of that so that the, uh, there's no chance of breaking it and now we can go ahead and take it off the bottom there we go sprue is gone now there'll be a little pimple you'll need to sand back that is on a surface that may be seen depending on the model uh, but to see it you'll be looking through a window on this particular model at least anyway so it's not that critical you don't need to get uh, too carried away gently rub the file backwards and forwards take the high spots off excellent and on this one all we need to do is sand the bottom get it nice and flat you don't want to take too much off because the door won't be high enough and we'll get ourselves a skewer put a dob of glue on it when you're putting only small dobs on this glue dries very quickly you do need to work reasonably fast put a skewer in place and there we go so next I'll do four windows so we'll do the first one show you how that's done and then I'll work on the next now these connect on the lip and so you just work your way around taking it away on the lip in the corner there we go it broke off by itself file the uh, the lip back place it just there like so grab our skewer now this window I'm going to leave the bottom sprue on for painting because it gives me something to hold and that flat surface at the bottom goes inside the um, panel itself so you're not going to see it and you can touch it up a little bit with a you know a very small paintbrush at the end so what I'll do is starting at the top I'll just go down the side and break those away and then I'll cut that long one off so that one's ready we'll put it on that frame there the uh, next one I'll do are the little gas bottles now these actually snap away quite easily and then you just need to rub the base with this you don't go backwards and forwards you hold it nice and tight get it as square as you can and just go in one direction because that way you won't develop a rocking motion and you'll end up with a nice flat base that way the bottle itself will stand up okay now for this I'll use the skewers with a pointy end on them a little bit off so you've got about a just over a sixteenth of an inch millimeter and a half end we'll lay our bottle in a little groove there glue on the end okay so next we're going to cut away the oil tank it's got a little tap you just need to be very careful that you just snip it very gently there's two parts one on the end of it and one underneath the tap so you cut the underneath the tap bit away first and then slowly work your way down that sprue so I don't know whether you can see it or not but there's a gap there now that way when we cut the next bit at the back and do the same thing trimming it back and removing that giving you a little bit of a gap now you should be able to see the gap there's no pressure on the tap and I'll just even take that a little bit further away and start to remove it from the base the base we just slowly work our way round gently snipping just underneath or the top of the sprue and supporting it as you go and then just trim away the sprue so that you're slowly relieving the tension on it so that it doesn't break now on the feet there'll be a little bit of cleanup required and then very carefully put on the emery board just very gently 
keep running it backwards and forwards until you've got a nice flat piece. All right, and this one, there's a hole in the bottom, one of the pointy skewers, put a little bit of glue on if you like. We have our little air compressor. Now this has got a lot of little fine sprues connecting the cylinders to the top of the compressor and they just break away really easily. So just get in there and just give them a bit of a haircut, trimming them back. If you can't quite do it, your cutters, get your knife and uh, just break them off. Right, and then when you've done that, gently, don't have to necessarily cut all the way through. Just what we're trying to do is break it enough that the tension is not there when you're cutting another one. And then that way, because it's partially cut through, the chances are it'll just fall away. Okay, there's one in there, and there we have it. Same thing, there'll be a few little extra bits. Just need a little bit of a tidy up. These will be noticeable. I'll take a file and just file those back. So I have in this set a bin and bin lid that's empty. So you can see inside it, which is pretty cool. So the bin lid is very thin, and so you do need to be quite careful when you snip it. So just very gently, a little bit of a pimple left behind. Now what we will be doing with the lid, and we'll do the same thing for the bin, is we'll take one of our modeler's racks, a couple of our skewers, and we're going to stand the skewer up on the end, like so. More for the bin lid. So we'll roll the bin lid over. You'll notice it's got a handle on it, so it won't quite sit flat, but it will sit flat enough for, the pur for this purpose. We'll take our glue. Now the bin could have been laid up on the top the same as the other, but the lid, unfortunately, would be problematic trying to make that work. So doing it this way is by far the easiest. Now we have a rubbish bin with a lid partially on and not quite sure whether you can see that but there's rubbish in there and so the lid is actually sitting on the rubbish. So again with this one we want to be starting at the top just very gently working your way around the back of the bin and then we'll just take those three parts off. It'll cut away from the bottom really easily. So we'll start by taking our nippers and just cleaning up the back and then We'll take our file and just very carefully take the, the tops off where it where the sprues were attaching at the back. Pop it up on our rack. Okay, so we're going to do the pellets in. These are fairly quick and easy. Um, I'll snip them all away and uh, and then we'll set them up for gluing. Same as the a lot of the parts, you just work your way around, put to one side, move on to the next one. If you haven't done a lot of this sort of thing where you're working with your hands filing and over a period of time you'll develop a feel that will allow you to know almost without looking that you've done the job. All I'm trying to do is knock away the little proud parts where the sprues were connected. So when I first start there's a little bit of resistance and then it runs smoothly. As soon as it goes smooth I'm down to the point where I've got a flat surface. Get our glue, get a dub on there and just rest it on top. Little hand trolleys. These are a little bit fiddly. Start at the top, remove that one just very gently. Same with the two on the sides. Now you can snip those away and then each wheel and then finally snip away at the base. Now there's one at the back here. You just remove to get in there. And there we have it. We'll get a little uh, needle file in a minute and tidy that one up. Just flatten off the bottom and just get into the back of it a little bit where the bruise are on the cross part. Okay, so have a little bit of leftover MDF. Okay, now we have a nice little strip that we can mount things on. And all I'm going to do is just stick those at an angle so I can get to, to that easily. The window and the little protectors. Now that's probably going to wobble around a little bit too much. So what I will do is I'll just get another piece of tape and put along the edge there just to hold that tape down. I'll still rock around a little bit, it won't be quite so bad, and I'll do the same to the front side. These parts have got quite a large surface area, and when you're airbrushing them, the air coming out from the airbrush will want to push them around, and you want to keep the airbrush at a consistent distance from, from the part to get a consistent looking paint job. Okay, so you have everything now glued on skewers, pop them up on there, 
appropriate spots and uh, get the bench ready for adding the, uh, the primer. So I'm now ready to paint these parts. Um, I'm going to paint them with Vallejo's Surface Primer Israel Sand. I've pre-mixed some of that in the airbrush along with some thinner and a little bit of airbrush flow improver and I've back washed it so that it mixes well within the brush itself. So I'll just move that to one side, we'll bring those ones up, we'll turn on our spray booth, make sure that we're getting a good flow. Now with pellets and items where you do need to get a little bit of paint in underneath, I usually start there first. So this is a two coat process and we just want to mist it slightly for the first coat. Just quickly working around, spinning it about, trying to get some into those little cracks, grooves etc. Dry. Don't want to overfill it at this stage because we don't want to fill in all those little lines that give you the detail. It's just getting that first little mist coat on. This palette is, yep, dry enough. We can get that next coat on. That'll do. Okay, that's it. Simple as that. Okay, so we're going to paint uh, these 3D parts for the model with um, Vallejo um, Grey. Okay, so these parts for the uh, workshop, the bench, uh, the locker, the shelf, a couple of bins. Um, we're going to be painting that with German Red Brown. So I'm about to paint the windows and doors and I'm choosing to try uh, Midstone. It's um, a Vallejo um, air colour paint, so it's, it's uh, a little thinner than the uh, model colour, um, so it doesn't need as much thinning, because um, I think the, uh, the contrast of those for the doors will, uh, will look quite nice. So we'll give that a try. If we don't like it, we uh, can always give it another coat of paint. So we got all that done, we'll uh, let that dry and see what it looks like. Doing the final test to make sure that everything fits and, uh, and this window, now it's off its sprue, needs to be sanded a little bit. So, Henry board and just rub it backwards and forwards. Square file and just give it a very light rub towards the back. Yep, that'll be alright. So I just need to take a little bit off the bottom. Okay, so that's good. Of course, this one fits in there nicely. So that's looking pretty smart. Uh, lightly fit all of the components, the brick parts, the windows, everything, without the glass and the roof. And then we'll mist a couple of different weathering colours over the whole building. So then that way, where it sort of runs across the building, it runs between the different colours, the, over the bricks, the doors, everything, consistently. Then once we've done that and it's dry, then we'll get carefully pop it back out, put the um, acetate on the windows, and um, and then glue everything in. So this was painted concrete grey and while I've been painting other things where there's been a little bit of uh, colour left that I could use for uh, for weathering I, I have done that so I'm not sure where that shows up. I oh, guess it does. So you can see that it's a little bit mottly. Well that's you know typical grime on the concrete. So we're already starting to do the weathering etc and that'll set up like so and our roof on. Roof of course will be weathered as well. So it's now time to fit the brick panels, um, so we're going to glue those into the structure. You need to test fit all the bits because now you've put that final coat of paint on. The paint of course added some thickness to the doors and the door frames need to double check to make sure everything is going to fit together. So uh, for the doorway I'm going to use Speed Bond because it does dry very quickly. So we're just going to put a little bit of glue just along the very back edge. Same on the side. Start at the top and just very carefully push it in so that it's flush with the back surface. 
a little bit of masking tape, make sure that's lined up at the back, put a little bit on there just, just for five minutes while that glue sets up and holds itself in place. I'm using the RC Modeler's Canopy Glue. Another thing with this glue is that it absolutely dries clear. And so if there's a little bit that squeezes out that we miss, uh, you won't see it. Uh, and if you do have a little gap, you can squeeze a little bit of glue into the gap. It dries clear, and then afterwards you can just very lightly touch it up with the paintbrush. So what we want is just a thin line. You, you can buy these syringes with different size needles from your hobby shop. It's also a deluxe materials product. Again, we're going to push through from the front, and that way if there is any glue, the beading will happen on the back side, which we're not going to see. And I can wipe it away anyway. But we want the surface level at the back for this particular build. Sometimes I'll put it at the front, sometimes I'll put it in the middle. But this one, um, because we've decided to make these bricks a feature brick wall, um, the idea is that they would have recessed them as part of the feature. Then the last thing we need to do while it's sitting on the back, on its back like that, um, uh, is glue on our awning. They simply get glued on, centered, lining up the little detail line. And I go to the bottom of the line so that before I glue them on, I look down them to make sure that they're lining up correctly. So that's that looks good. I'm happy with that. So I'll take some of my speed bond, put a little smear along there, just very carefully eyeballing the sides. Now the other thing when you look at these. Um, the corrugated metal goes on an angle through it. So I like to put it with the angle um, coming back to the building so that the rainwater would go back into a gutter system at this end rather than the other way up where it would run out to nowhere because there's no gutter. Again, a little bit of designing license and a little bit of imagination in terms of how I think about it. You can do it the other way if you want. You can even add a gutter if you want. End of the day, it is going to be your building and your build sight down it, make sure we've got them lined up nicely. We're now at the stage in the video where we want to apply the sign. But as you can see, the building is a lot more finished than where we are. And that's because I got all excited and forgot all about putting the signs on. So that's what I'm going to do now. And we have a sheet of signs. Now the signs themselves are fairly simple to make. Obviously you don't need to name this structure Doug's Repair Shop. It could be something completely different. So all I've done is I've printed these signs on a piece of 80 GSM standard office paper. So you can do the same, no problem. If you're going to use an inkjet printer, test it first to see if the, if the ink bleeds when you apply um, a glue solution to it before you try and put it on the building. But I'm just using a standard laser printer that has a reasonably high resolution. So the first thing we need to do is cut our signs away. So with a nice steel rule and a new sharp blade. Now we supply extras because you know you could make a mistake. If the blade is not sharp, you can tear the edge of the paper, which would be noticeable when you put it on the building itself. Okay, so there's our two signs. The other one is spare, and we have a no entry sign for the workshop. So I'll cut that out now as well. We glue these on with a diluted uh, white glue mix. I use the speed bond. And the first thing you need to do uh, is to sand the back of the sign down. And the, I'm using just a, uh, a 180 grit, fairly coarse paper. And you want to make it reasonably thin. So with a finger at one end of the sign, just very gently stroke away from your finger and do the other end. And then when you've got enough off, with a clean sanding block or some finer sandpaper, remove any little fur balls that might be sticking up. Give the sign a wipe and get all the dust and bits off it. Okay, so you take your sign and very carefully locate it on the face, checking to make sure you've got it central. And then when you're happy you've got it square and central and nicely lined up, you roll it back, take a paintbrush with your solution and paint it on the building. Then very carefully run your finger along the sign, just feeling for any little bubbles. Then do the other thing, other, then do the other end, peeling it back just enough to expose the painted area that's already there paint away. And the same thing, just very gently. Okay, 
and there we have it. Make sure there's no little bubbly bit sticking out and then just give it a very light coat of the glue mixture just to seal it. Hopefully I didn't have my big head in there all the time. Okay, and then let's leave that to, uh, to dry up. Now we'll do the other end. And there we have it, Doug's repair shop is almost done. We need to still do a little bit more weathering, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll get that done shortly. Okay, so we've almost finished the structure. We've got to glaze it, the other detail parts, etc. But right now what I want to do is just give it a mist coat of uh, the Vallejo Grey wash. That'll just dull things down a little bit and uh, start to get the grimy look happening. We'll be adding some pigments and, and powders and bits and pieces afterwards, uh, but this is just the first stage of, of uh, getting it looking like it's actually in the real world. Now with the wash, uh, other than giving it a good shake, you can just put it straight in the gun as it is. So you can see now there's a little bit of uh, griminess on the doorways and the windows. Probably could do it just a touch more on the tops of the awnings. Yep, that'll do. So we'll put that to one side, we'll let that dry up and uh, pop the windows back out, glaze them and start fitting some of the other uh, 3D parts that go with this kit. Okay, so our model is nearing completion and one of the last jobs to do is to fit the glass. And so I don't want to have the glass totally pristine on this model. What I want to do is just add a little bit of um, grime to the windows. Not so much on these front ones where the office is, but certainly on the workshop windows. So I'm going to uh, mix up a, a little brew of a dirty sandy colour. I'll just take a window on the office. Really only needs it from one side, but let's be consistent. And again, it's just a fleckling of paint. It's just a, you know, very, very light misting colour that until you actually see it with the naked eye, you're just not going to see it. Um, on the front windows and the door, just a tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bit, just to kill that shine. So I'll put that to one side, we'll let it dry up. So first up, we'll pop out uh, the windows, lift the uh, roof off. Now I use Modeler's Canopy Glue. Um, I've got that loaded up in a syringe and I'm just simply going to put a few little dobs of glue around the outside of the window on the frame. Now this dries really clear. So if any of these dobs of glue spread onto the glass, which they probably will, you really won't notice them. You don't want to get carried away with putting too much on, but, uh, but don't be overly concerned. Now I frosted that a little more towards the top, so drop it into the frame like so, and we'll let that sit for a sec. Same thing with this one. I'm not sure what you can see, but you can see the, the uh, glass, the, the glue has sort of spread a little bit. Um, and yes, if you look really, really closely, you will see it. But it's, uh, when it dries up, it's, it is really clear and not that noticeable. And the door just on the sides. Come in, give them a push down. Now once that's done, we can carefully put our windows back in the building. But this time, we'll take some canopy glue and uh, we'll attach them permanently. So just a little bit of glue around the outside. Take our window, make sure you don't have glue on your fingers. Pushing it through so that the back of the window is flush on the inside of the on the inside of the hole. Now we've got a little bit of glue that's snuck its way through the front. Even though that's going to dry clear, I still will remove most of it. Same deal. Now you want to be very careful when you're handling it because a little knock and it can sit skew with and you might not notice that until the glue dries up. Put our front windows in and doorway. And there we go. We have our glass in. Just checking to make sure I haven't knocked anything. No, looking good. Okay, so I'll put that to one side. Adding the 3D scenic detail parts is a personal choice as to how you want the scene to look. 
I simply use either the Speed Bond or the RC Modeler's canopy glue and place a small amount of glue on the base of the item so it can't be seen. The two guys welding in the doorway are a Woodland Scenics product and not included in the kit. Okay, so this is a little bit of a fiddly process, but this is what I'm doing. I am estimating roughly where I want the little stands to go. Now that one I've already put a couple of dobs of glue on, but what I've got here is a little bit of plastic and I'm putting each leg into the glue so it's got a, a little bit of glue on. And then I'm putting the stand roughly where I think it's going to need to be. So I'm having a little bit of a guess. Now I've used the speed bond for that because it dries quite quickly. So I'll do the same thing with the tripod. And I'm going to get a toothpick and try and get a little dob on top of our stands, like so, and then very carefully. Alright, now, I won't dare touch that for a moment or two. We'll, let, uh, we'll give it 10 minutes to dry up, and then we'll try and position our welders in place. There we go, I've got that guy in the place, and now we'll do the other one. Like so. Alright, so a little of that glue dry, and uh, this scene now is pretty much done. Okay, so our building is pretty much done. There's just a couple of things that I want to touch up. The edges of the signs. Uh, I want to put a little bit of weathering powder on the concrete floor just to make it look a little bit more used. I'm going to apply some oil and petrol stains around our drums and that should be pretty much should do it. So using a number zero brush I'm going to apply some Vallejo dark grey wash to the edges of the signs to disguise where they've been cut. So this is a little bit fiddly. Uh, the reason why I'm using the wash is the wash is thin enough that it'll penetrate the paper and I don't need to end up with black lines on the building that um, uh, will be seen. So let's just get, that's a good spot for it. And just wipe the excess away with your finger. Okay, so that's much better. Um, the fact there's a couple of little dirty marks on the lines and bits and pieces, that's fine because that's what would happen in real life from a weathering point of view. So Vallejo uh, engine fuel stains and Vallejo engine oil stains. So each of these drums have got these little tiny lids. So I'm just applying some around the, the lid itself, a little bit around the, the ground where the drums are being stored. Because on this side of the building, the, the uh, drums, these are all the, the used drums. A little bit streaking down the side of the drum. Fuel stain on the on the uh, workbench. Some of the um, SMS, the Scale Modeler's Supply powders. Now this is uh, something I found at a local hobby shop. Um, concrete dust and and just straight dust. And I've had a little bit of a play with it, and it actually looks quite nice when um, when you mix it together to give you a bit of a grimy dirty look um, and a streaky sort of you know concretey dirty look uh, from a workshop point of view so I've um, been playing around on on this as a bit of a palette and we're going to add a little bit of just dirty marks not so much um, like a vehicle movement but um, just a lot of the layer of, of grime to sell the story that this is a, a working environment and any workshop is going to have some different layers of dirt and grime on it. I also mixed up some of them in a shot glass here that uh, gives me a slightly different colour. Now some street marks coming in and out through the doorway sells the idea that we're moving things in and out so sometimes you want directional marks and sometimes you want just sort of splotches same thing inside we're just going to braid a little bit around I scraped a few things on the on the concrete floor you know what these workers are like they don't clean their boots okay and then finally as far as the dusting is concerned we'll dust the building a little bit It'll take a bit of the shine off this nice paintwork that we've done don't forget the doorway the lucky last we're going to put the same sort of thing on the roof but you need to make sure that we only go in the one direction because so there we go we have a nice dusty dirty grimy looking building that looks like uh, it's done some work
Thanks for buying Doug's Repair Shop. I really look forward to seeing some of the photos of your build and perhaps with your permission, post a few in our gallery. I hope you had as much fun building Doug's Repair Shop as I did. I'm Chris the Modeler at ABR Model Works. Have a great day and happy modeling.